Hello and welcome to Rappler Talk. I'm Maria Ressa. Today we have a treat. The author of this book, The Creating Brain, The Neuroscience of Genius. I love it on every front. Dr. Nancy Andreessen is in the Philippines for four days. She's joining us now to tell us about the secrets of creativity. Dr. Andreessen, nice to have you here. Nice to be here. So you've done so much work on this. Um, what is the secret of creativity? Well, the, the truth is there is no answer to that question. There, there is no secret to creativity. Uh, if I were to pick one thing, I would say it's intense curiosity. Okay, intense curiosity, I love it. What, and what does that mean? That means looking at the world around you and wondering how it works and wondering how you can, depending on your talents, how you could express that to other people. And, you know, you might look at the world around you and see how fascinating and complex it is and become a scientist to explain that complexity and pursue it, uh, figure out how it works. But you might look at the world around you and see sermons in stones. Uh, as Shakespeare would say, yeah. and so you know, you could look at the beautiful world and become a poet or yeah. a novelist or a painter. And do you see them as, I mean, that kind of creativity versus, say, the science, a scientific creativity, or in the world of technology now, looking at um, science and creativity of, of art? Are these mutually exclusive, or are they the same thing? They're definitely not mutually exclusive, and. I'm currently doing a study of highly creative people, half of whom are artists, half of whom are scientists. And when I began the study, I had them divided into those two groups. Now that I've studied uh, close to 20 of them, it's become really clear that a lot of scientists are also artists and have artistic interests or abilities. And a lot of the artists, in fact, are, you know, very versed in the sciences, use them in their everyday work. And one of the things that I've observed is that a lot of creative people are, are what are known as polymaths. They have interests in many fields. Poly means many, mathane in Greek means knowledge. So they have knowledge about many different things and they put those together all the time. And they just can't help being curious about multiple different topics. So, so creative people find connections to things that normal people think are separate, right? Yeah. Um, you, you write about the neuroscience of genius. I mean, from looking at the fMRIs, the functional magnetic resonance images, from looking at the brain and the neuroscience of it, what, what conclusions, what main conclusions have you come out with? Well, it's still a work in progress, and I'd say two things about it. One is that I'm surprised at how much we can see about individual brains, because in general, people who do imaging studies collect a group, average it together, and the design when we began this study was to have a group of artists, a group of scientists, and then a group of people who did not pursue. So a control group, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I was expecting to do a big mix of artists, scientists, and controls. I've now concluded that we may just mix all the creative people because they do have so much in common in terms of uh, multiple interests and so on. So that's item one. The other item is that I'm also amazed at how much we can see in individual brains that define that particular person, which most people don't do with functional magnetic resonance imaging because it's generally not thought to be sensitive enough. But I'll, I'll give you an example. One of our subjects uh, is a very famous Nobel Prize winning physicist. And we, uh, as it happened, when we were walking away from the scanner, he asked me, who chose those numbers? because one of the tasks is a simple word association task yeah. where they're looking at words 
saying them silently, and then the comparison task is looking at numbers and saying them silently, because you can't have any speech inside the scanner because it'll produce movement and blur the image. So he asked, who, who chose those numbers? And I said, I, I don't remember, it was so long ago. Probably it was me. And he said, well, do you realize you had a series of five prime numbers in there? So when we look at his MR scans, his FMR, he had a very prominent activation in his right hemisphere, which reflected the number component. And a lot of the people who are postdocs in my lab are people who trained in cognitive neuroscience in a neurology department which uses the lesion method, which leads to a very sim oversimplified view of how the brain works. And so I had this one postdoc who said, this doesn't make any sense. He's got this big activation uh, in Broca's area for the control task. And I said, you know, that makes perfect sense because he's a physicist, and for him, numbers are language. Right. Uh, we just had another person who was a very good visual artist who had really unusual, he didn't have, didn't appear to have any activations in the word association task and big activations in the number task. And I asked him, what were you thinking about? Uh, when you were silently reading those numbers. And he said, I was turning them into sentences and telling stories with them. So it, again, just strange activations, but that's, you know, reflects his creativity. So, so when, you, when you did the fMRIs of the brain scans of these creative people, did you see, were they, were these guys the outliers or was that normal that uh, they had, they reacted differently to the stimulus. It was not typical. I mean, okay. not, it was perfectly normal, but not typical, not what you would expect. Interesting. The, the conventional wisdom from the past is that creativity lies in the left, on the left side of your brain. Usually it's creativity lies on the, the right, right side. side. The, right. the left side. Normally, yeah, right side, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But I it's, see, it's not worth worrying about because it's not true. It's not true. Okay, yeah. so if you can, I guess, for, for laymen, I mean, what what are the some truths that, that have come out of the studies that you're doing? Well, when I began the study, one of the big challenges was to choose a task that would tap into whatever creativity is. How do you define creativity? The ability to conceive of something that's novel and also, in some sense, useful. Uh, and the sense of useful may mean writing poetry because, or writing music, because those things are useful. Absolutely. Uh, but if you, you know, if you create something that's novel but bizarre and no utility, that's not cre creativity. Okay. So you said the task was, the first task is... Yeah, so when I decided I wanted to do this new study that was going to use neuroimaging, the enormous challenge was to figure out what kind of task to use. Uh, especially it was a challenge because I knew I was going to do both artists and scientists, so I had to bridge across what I thought would be the differences. And I probably spent 10 years thinking about that. I, and what I finally came to was the notion that what characterizes creative people is that they can see connections associations, relationships that are novel and original or that other people can't see or can't see as well. And so I chose the tasks as things that would tap into what we call the association cortices of the brain, which are like right here, back here, uh, down in here. And uh, so we decided to do a word association task a picture association task, and a pattern detection task. And it, it's looking as if those were very good selections. It, it, you know, it's obvious, at least it's obvious to me, that you can't ask somebody to be creative while they're in a noisy MR scanner. Right. 
the, you also did um, interviews and then the the brain scans when you when you did these simultaneously. Were there things that popped out that came out in the interviews but not in the scans, or came out in the scans but not in the interviews? Were there what insights were different? Yeah, I would say that there were things that came out in the interviews that you wouldn't necessarily see from the scans. The interviews are a really important part of this study. I, I, I interview everybody for generally at least five hours. And I was just interviewed by somebody somewhere in the last couple of weeks. And they said, so how do you interview these people? Do you use a skid? A skid is a structured interview to make psychiatric diagnoses. <laughs> and I said, never, ever. Yeah, I, I can't <laughs> imagine you would. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I do have a structured interview. It starts out by asking them uh, where they were born, where they grew up, what their parents were like, what their parents' occupations were like, what their siblings, their family was like, and so on. And I just basically start at the beginning and move forward in time to where they are in the present. And in the process, you know, learn a lot about how they develop the interests that they have. And of course, there's a section on how do you get your ideas and a lot of times people will just volunteer yeah, some of this they, stuff spontaneously. Did you see the lines, and again the, this is conventional wisdom, the lines between creativity, genius, and insanity? I mean, how do you define that? Well, you know, I kind of regret using the word genius because it's, it's misleading. And people think of genius and then they think of high IQ and you know, I get letters from people who say, I belong to Mensa, therefore yeah, I'm a genius. It's not Mensa, yeah, yeah. You, I'm assuming you're using genius to somebody who's, who's created something that's- Yeah, I meant, that's what I really meant to yeah. do. Uh, I think I chose genius because historically it's a word that has been used a lot to refer to creative people. Right. But I would, if I were to do another book, I think I would just call it the well, see, you can't say the creating brain, the neuroscience of creativity. So that's probably why, why genius. And genius, but what, again, the, the conventionalism is that you kind of have to, to be emotional or on the other side of insane to find these connections. Do you see anything like that? I mean, genius and insanity and emotions, what role do these things play? Well, you know, as is described in that book, uh, a number of years ago, I did a study of creative writers because I was in Iowa City, yeah. and Iowa City has the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is easily the most famous creative writing program in the world. And I'd been an English professor there, so I, you know, I knew the core faculty in the workshop, and I knew, the, you know, the directors of the workshop, and so it was quite easy to recruit a sample. I mean, it took a long time because. The workshop rotates its faculty, has like four permanent faculty, and then every year it brings in uh, two or three or four additional faculty who stay just for a year and are typically quite famous people. Like that's how I got John Irving and Kurt Vonnegut and, and the like. Uh, so, Creativity and genius and insanity. Yeah, insanity. <laughs> insanity, yeah. Like a Van Gogh. The craziness that comes, is, is that a stereotype? Well, craziness is not the right word either. In fact, that's the word that it, people are not allowed to use in my family. <laughs> and, um, because it's very pejorative. Right? Right. So, when I, what I really expected in that study was that the writers wouldn't have major problems, but they would have both more creativity and more mental illness is the term I would use in their, their family members. And the reason I thought that is that I knew, uh, like James Joyce had a daughter with schizophrenia, Bertrand Russell had a family that was just full of schizophrenia, Einstein had a son with schizophrenia. What happened was that these writers would come in my office, and I, I was a young psychiatrist at the time, and so I was a little shy about interviewing these people. 
they would come in my office, they would sit down, they would talk for four or five hours, and they would describe the psychiatric problems that they had had. And it was almost always some form of mood disorder, either depression or uh, highs and lows, manic depressive illness or bipolar, bipolar disorder. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, it's a saying in science, when you have a hypothesis and you don't confirm it and find something different, you've probably discovered something important. So, yes, in that group, for sure, there was a very strong connection. In the study I'm doing now, there's still a strong connection. Uh, not quite as strong as in the workshop study, and a little more diverse, and I'm getting a little bit of schizophrenia spectrum type stuff. However, you know, using the word insane or whatever, no, they, they, they weren't off the wall. Like a Vincent Van Gogh type. Van Gogh, um, I mean, for sure he had severe psychiatric problems. What they prob probably were was a very severe mood disorder. So, so the, the hypothesis that you proved, how would you crystallize it in a sentence? There is an association between creativity and mental illness. So far, the strongest association that's been found has been with mood disorder as one kind of mental illness. And that relationship is present in writers, it's present in scientists, and it's present in the what we call the first degree relatives of these people, which are parents, siblings, and offspring. So it's something that runs in families. And the thing I found in the workshop study that was very intriguing was that it wasn't creativity and writing that ran in the families. It was many different kinds of creativity, creativity in science. So associative thinking that can do something else. Yeah. Interesting. What, what about the line between um, emotions and uh, rational thought? Uh, I, I seem to remember some study that said that a lot of, it could go to up, up to 80% of how we make decisions is based on, people would think it's rational, but that it's based more on emotions. Does this stuff come out? Yeah, I mean, I, there are a number of people who have made that point. Maybe, uh, maybe you've you read Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman, correct. Um, the yeah. emotional intelligence. Yeah. Got his Nobel in economics. There is no Nobel in you know a field like psychology. What he was showing was that people have perceptions that. As you say, they think they're rational, but they're not. And I think that's pretty common. I don't think that that's especially linked to creativity, though. I think it just illustrates that human beings uh, don't exactly understand how their minds work. So when you say creativity, then, so for a normal person now who says, I want to be more creative, what would you tell them? How can, how can people nurture creativity? Aside from having mental illness in your family, which is a little scary, but, but please, how, would, how, how can somebody nurture I think um, do things that expand your world. And, you know, for example, when I made the change from literature and history to science, medicine, neuroscience, uh, it was so joyous to have more knowledge. And I think, without doubt, it made me a more creative person as well. So, I mean, there are lots of things that you can do. If people decide to do them, then they have to do them seriously. You can't just skim the surface of something. But, uh, you know, Often people have wanted to learn to play a musical instrument. Don't just want, do. If you have a longing to be a writer, try to start writing. Uh, learn more about a new field. I'm having 
a great deal of fun right now because I'm working on another book called The Age of Light, The Impact of Scientific Discovery from Newton to Curie. Wow. And I'm having to completely immerse myself in Newton, Michael Faraday, James Clark Maxwell, and Marie Curie. And I really immerse myself. So I've read most things that Newton wrote and almost every biography that's written, been written about him. Well, most things that Newton wrote in English, because he wrote a lot in Latin. Uh, and it's just absolutely fascinating. And I'm giving myself the challenge of being Newton in Newton's time, not Newton as we know him now, you know, several centuries later, where we know about, you know, atoms and electrons and so on. When Newton was writing, I mean, nobody knew about any of those things. Right, right. Nor did they know about really, based on clear evidence, the nature of the solar system, never mind the nature of the universe. So you're looking at it, you're looking at it to see the connections he was making, given what was known at that time. Um, in, in terms of uh, spending your life, I mean, you've spent a lot of your research on creativity. Why? Why are you... Well, I would say I would say it's actually my hobby, and it probably helps me be more creative. I mean, what I'm known for is uh, being a very major research researcher in the area of schizophrenia, redefining the illness. I mean, and I one of the things we say when we're re reviewing grants for people is this the kind of research that will rewrite textbooks. And for sure, the research I've done in schizophrenia has caused textbooks to be rewritten. Right. Different definitions of the disease, different understanding, well, understanding that it's related to brain abnormalities, just a lot of different contributions. So. Um, Why creativity? Why creativity? Yeah, how did you go So I, I, I actually decided to do creativity because um, partly it was something I knew I knew something about that very f few other people doing neuroscience research would actually know about I in an in-depth way because I you know I mean I, I, see, I, see, I, see I was an undergraduate major in history English and philosophy so I you know I mean I knew a lot yeah. about the arts and then when I did my PhD it was on the Renaissance lit John Donne, uh, and so th that was an area of tremendous strength. And for fun, I wanted to think about that from the perspective of my new life and new area of knowledge. Given technology today and how it is, like it seems like we're in this period of creative destruction because the new technology is changing uh, relationships, businesses, uh, society in general. What what are you seeing? How, I guess, is a, a person, how does creativity fit in the new realities that we have now? I don't think I know the answer to that question, but, but I'll, I'll say something Please. triggered by the question. I, you know, the world we're in right now, there is more technology and the environment around us is changing faster than I think it's ever changed in human life. And I think that it's going to be important to try to strike a balance between what you can do with the technology and to understand what you might lose if you used it too much. And I, I walk around this science museum and I see the little notations that say be sure to stop and read. And that's really, really, really important. And I don't see that many people doing it. And I, I find it just tremendously upsetting that so many people are, you know, a family, just say a family of four people, they're going out to dinner together, they're sitting in a restaurant, and at least two of them are not talking, that they're playing with their cell phones. I, I, and you know, you just see it all the time. And I, I think that's such a bad thing. I mean, I, 
those devices are meant to make our life better and easier, but they're not meant to disconnect us from the people around us. And that's just one little example. I mean, there are lots and lots of different forms of technology that are supposedly making our lives easier and, you know, making businesses function more smoothly and so on. But I, uh, I don't think socially we're going to be able to keep up with it. Fingers crossed. I, I want to go back to the most, in, like to me, the most fascinating um, part that you said, which is that creativity some, is, seems to be linked to some kind of mental illness. I guess, what are the implications of, of that finding and where do you see it heading? Well, for me, one of the most important implications is people with mental illness actually enrich our lives. It's a, there is so much stigma attached to mental illness, and yet if people think about it, uh, I don't think we would probably have had a Van Gogh without the mental illness. Uh, and that holds for many, 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 many creative people. Uh, you know, pick, uh, I don't know, Picasso, pick, you know, just pick just about anybody. And uh, they have often been touched with mental illness. And I have a a little musical thing, it's a song by Don McLean, uh, Starry Starry Night about Vincent, and I've synced pictures of famous people who've also had mental illness to the words of the song, and so, you know, it had, flashes up Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, Beethoven. Uh, all, all of them have yeah. the streaks of mental illness. Wow. So I, th I think it's important for people to re realize and appreciate that uh, mental illness and creativity can be closely linked. Right? Judy Woodruff, who's a I know Judy Woodruff. Yeah. Yeah. She did a little documentary on me last summer, and she interviewed Kurt Vonnegut's son, Mark Vonnegut, and Mark said something that I thought was both sweet and important. He was talking about veterans, actually, from the recent wars in, that America has been in. And he said, we ought to be taking better care of our veterans. So many of the homeless are veterans. We should be help, helping them out. You go to a homeless place, there could be a Kurt Vonnegut in there. There could be a Van Gogh in there. There could be all kinds of people in there. And it's just wrong not to support people who have mental illness. This is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your last thoughts. I mean, this is your your time in the Philippines. I mean, the Do I have a last ahead. thought? Yeah, any last thoughts in terms of what you want people to, to focus on? Um, I think that probably each individual person should be doing more to enrich his or her life. We live in such a, a, you know, fabulous environment in terms of the opportunities around us to see and think and do. And lots of people are just sitting on their rear ends in front of a TV watching one soap opera after another. And that's not going to enrich your life. Fantastic. That is a great message. Thank you so much. We've been speaking with Dr. Andreessen on creativity, how to enrich your life. Fascinating insights in this. Please stay tuned. We'll give you more of Rapper Talk. I'm Maria Ressa. Thanks for joining us.